And there's a there's a a problem set for tree interpretation, and we may go we'll probably spend some time going over that um, down here. So this is all very conceptual. Well, let's take a concrete example and go through it in, in a few minutes for man. So in, in about 1990, I, I worked in Noel Pace's lab um, look, looking at the structure of RNA-SPRNA. And, and a source for data for this is, is sequences from a variety of organisms. Now at the time, it was a really big deal to clone and sequence the gene encoding RNA-SPRNA. It was a ton of work. And so in order to get the maximum amount of information, we were looking for organisms as diverse and different from things we already knew about as we could get. So a guy in John Barrows' lab, um, Ralph Pledger, I think was his name, um, isolated an organism from a deep-sea hydrothermal vent sample, and this strain of bacterium was called ES2. And some lipid analysis suggested that it might be pretty interesting. And so the, art, so the question for me was, what is the phylogenetic placement of this organism? And is it as different from other organisms as it looks? And so we did actually one of the first PCR experiments with ribosomal RNA to, to, chunk, to pull a chunk of it out and sequence it. This represents a fair bit of work. Today it's trivial. You get them by the hundreds of thousands. But at the time, it was a lot of work. Here's the secondary structure of that RNA drawn out by hand and added to the alignment. If this looks tough, uh, one of the first things I did on the computer was to, to, to do one of these in a drawing program, one letter at a time. Um, and before that, it, we used to use Zipatone letters, where you rub the little letters on to a piece of paper. So things are easier now. <laughs> so, so this sequence was put in an alignment, and some trees were generated. Find out where it is. And so it starts out with a preliminary sort of thing. So um, we, we took, at the time, there were only a couple of hundred seed ribosomal sequences of bacteria available. And so we took a representative from each of the major phylogenetic groups of bacteria, included the CS2 sequence to see where it fell. And so here's an outgroup, Methanococcus inaceae. At the time, it would have been Methanococcus inaceae. It changed the name. And then here's one representative from each of the major phylogenetic groups of bacteria. Um, e. coli is here. Here's, here's uh, spirochete, green sulfur bacterium. The Psyllis mycoides was a representative for the firmicutes, so-called low GC gram-positive bacteria. And sure enough, ES2 turned out to be a specific relative of the firmicutes. Still don't know, I mean, it's a pretty distant relative to the cells my but it's still specifically related to it. So let's zoom in on that group. And so here's a second tree with a collection of firmicutes included. Streptomyces griseus, which is an actinobacterium, is included as the outgroup. And then these are major kinds of firmicutes. So um, Here's, here's um, Penobacillus, here's some lactic acid bacteria, Staph, Listeria, Peptostreptococcus. And Eubacterium turns out to be specifically related to Eubacterium barkeri. This is an anaerobic, non endospore forming thing. And so a bunch of relatives in this part of the tree were collected. And this, this information was, wasn't available at the time this initial analysis was done. And it turns out that it is closely related to an organism isolated much later uh, from another hydrothermal vent than in the Azores. Related generally to a group of Clostridium and Eubacterium species that are involved in heterocyclic ring degradation. So, where's a good example? Ethanologenes, um, et cetera. So how is this information useful? I don't know exactly what kind of an organism I have, right? And as a result of that, I did not clone sequence the RNA-SPRNA from this thing. Because we already had a bunch of gram-positive 
RNA-seq sequences. We knew about how the structure worked. Um, it, it was not going to be that different from what we already knew about. And the effort involved would have been a lot, and it would have provided minimal information. Much better to focus on an organism like Thermotoga maritima, which is what we actually did, which, which really is a distant relative to the other sequences we had in hand, and provided much more bang for the buck. The flip side would have been just as useful, right? If it really was something way out on the, on the initial phylogenetic trees, something like Thermotoga maritima, then it definitely would have been worth the effort to get it. But it was not. And so this, this, this kind of phylogenetic information provides you with pragmatic info. It also, by the way, tells you a lot about the organism. And so this thing is related to, it was, named, it was ultimately named Eubacterium thermal marinus. The, the reason for this is m members of this group in general are named either Clostridium or Eubacterium based on whether they can form endospores. This is, it's, a, it's a crappy way to name things, but it's what people used to do. Thermal marinus means hot seed, right? Um, what can you tell about this organism, ES2, based on this phylogenetic placement, without knowing anything else about it? What kind of a cell wall do you think it has? Pretty positive, right? It's, these are all clostridia, new bacteria. You know what the cell wall of those things looks like. How many chromosomes do you think this thing has? One, because these organisms typically have a single major chromosome. Um, how do you think it makes a living? Every organism in this part of the tree is a heterotroph. It's probably a heterotroph, right? Um, probably an anaerobe and so forth and so on. Lacks electron transport chain because these organisms don't have electron transport. So there's a bunch of things that are common to this group of organisms that you ought to be able to predict are true of this thing as well. This is no different than if you were to take a museum sample and find out that a bone is from a mammal. If you know that a, that, that a bone is from a mammal, then the organism that bone came from had hair in some part of its life cycle, right? Probably had lactation. Probably was a heterotroph. I mean, there aren't any photosynthetic mammals, right? There's a bunch of information, really, really basic information you collect from a, from a phylogenetic tree like this. And we're going to talk about that a little more next time. Excuse me? What is written in pink? Oh, we're going to talk about it later. These are, these are bootstrap numbers, and we'll, we'll talk about those uh, next time.